1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4-10 through 10. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and the stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All right. So um, we have gotten through verses, uh, I think, 13 um, through 2, 3. So that's 1, 13 through 2, 3, which was a call to holiness. And... Now, Peter is going to move from there into this section, which if I were to use one word to kind of sum up what's happening here is he's really going to lean into our identity. Thus far, we've really talked a lot about ourselves as exiles and strangers. Uh, what this means is that we do have a home. It's just not here. So the, the question then is where is home? And that is what Peter answers in this text. And where is home has a huge bearing on what is my purpose, as we will find out in this text. So let's begin. It starts with, as you come to him. So uh, if we were to kind of just illustrate this, here is the living stone, right? which uh, this is going to be Jesus. And as you come to him, so this begins with us literally coming to Jesus. And that's important as we see in this image getting unpacked. So as you come to him in this act of going to the living stone, which is Jesus, and now he unpacks the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. Okay. Okay. So the living stone was rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, precious to him, him is God. Uh, this is going to be important uh, that the living stone is characterized this way, rejected by humans, but chosen by God. If there is a thing that uh, Peter will continue to return to throughout this letter, it is that we will be rejected by humans and chosen by God. But this makes sense because Jesus is the living stone. And as we're going to see, we model ourselves off of him. As you come to him, living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering acceptable sacrifice to God through Jesus Christ. So this as right here gets attached to this you also this living stone right here and his rejection by humans but chosen by god is played out in us who are also living stones and we're going to see this connection uh, between acceptance and rejection play out down here in these in these verses but for here let's look at how he applies this you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Okay, our being built, we are not the ones building ourselves. This is a passive act. We are being built. God is the one doing this. We are being built into a spiritual house, that is a temple. So the living stone, Jesus, who will later be the cornerstone as we go through this. These living stones, that is us, we are coming to the, to the living stone. 
And as we come to him, we are arranging ourselves into a temple, or rather we are being arranged into a spiritual house. We're being arranged person by person, brick by brick, stone by stone into a spiritual house. That's the first picture is a spiritual house. But there is a second picture of a holy priesthood. And now uh, we have to remember again from an Old Testament perspective that the priests were there to make uh, worship acceptable to God, right? They are, they are the intermediators. The, the people of Israel cannot just come to God on their own. They must go through the priest. And now we are not only a spiritual house, we are not only the temple of God, but the place where God dwells. We are also the priesthood, which um, here offers spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. What's incredible here is not for the world, but for ourselves. We're now able to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, who is our high priest. It is ultimately Jesus who makes our um, offerings acceptable, but through Jesus, we can now offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Spiritual sacrifices, not animals. But uh, think of a Romans uh, 12, 1 through 2. Uh, it's about a life lived in worship to God. So Peter's just made this quite bold statement here that um, Christ is the living stone, that we are stones that are going to be uh, built around him into a temple, and that we're going to be a holy priesthood. These massive claims, these are big identity claims, they need to be grounded in something. And so Peter goes to the Old Testament to prove that this is the case, that this is actually what God's intention was for humanity. And so he begins with verse 6, 4. I'm going to ground all this now. That's what Peter's saying. For in scripture it says, and he goes to a several texts. Here's the first one. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. This is Isaiah 28, 16. If you go to chapter 28, this is a chapter about judgment upon Ephraim, that's northern Israel, and Judah, which is southern Israel. And in this uh, text about judgment, there is this one verse of hope. And it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. So this is a uh, up here, um, living stone is rejected by humans, but chosen and precious to him. So this is uh, about Jesus. Peter's saying that Jesus is the stone. This is, this is Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The one who trusts in him. Another way we could write this would be believes in him. Oh, the one who has faith in him will never be put to shame. Now, in the context of Isaiah 28, uh, the point is that nobody puts their trust in the cornerstone and then they all get judged. And he's saying that there's a fulfillment of that in Jesus, that Jesus is the cornerstone. The ones who trust in him will never be put to shame, but many people will not put their trust in him and they will be judged, okay? And we'll see that play out, okay? Now, to you who believe... This stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, boom. Right? So there's a connection here. The one, those who believe, those who trust in him, you know, will never be put to shame. The stone is precious. We delight in God. And that makes sense. Remember verse 3, uh, you've tasted that God is good, right? Tasted that the Lord is good. For those who believe in Jesus, he is our precious cornerstone. But to those who did not believe, uh, which is like what the rest of Isaiah 28 is talking about, there are other texts that he brings in. Here's the first one. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is Psalm 118, verse 22. Psalm 118 is largely a, a celebration of God's deliverance. Uh, in the middle of that, verse 22, David has this line, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And the idea here is that the builders, right, the, the powerful people of Israel are kind of walking through a quarry 
and they're picking and looking for that great, great stone, which could be the cornerstone of a structure that's being built. And that uh, the stone that they rejected, the one they said, oh, this is not good enough. That one's become the cornerstone. And it's kind of a, a picture of David in a way, right? Who is young and unassuming and nobody would think that he would become king. And yet uh, the one that the builders rejected, he's become the, the cornerstone. Although this in Psalm 118 in some ways applies to David, it ultimately is a prophecy that looks forward to Jesus. And... Um, and then that, and that Isaiah 28 and Psalm 118 share a thread here in that there is this stone that gets rejected, but nevertheless, it is the cornerstone. So the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and, and he combines that with another text, which is Isaiah 8, uh, 14 which is a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And so what we see in this is there's a set of texts in the Old Testament that all speak to the stone, uh, the cornerstone. And they all have a prophetic bent to them and they all have a judgment bent to them and they all have a deliverance bent to them. So all of these things are wrapped up together. This one is someone's going to come who will be rejected and yet he will be the cornerstone. And in fact, not only will they reject him, uh, chapter 8, verse 14 of Isaiah, the stone causes people to stumble. That is, people literally trip up over the person of the cornerstone. The rock makes them fall. The Pharisees get tripped up over who Jesus is. They do not like him. So this is kind of prophetic grounding. And let's make sure that we're understanding what, what Peter is saying. He's saying, if Jesus is a cornerstone, uh, you don't have a cornerstone by itself. The cornerstone gets built up into some other thing. And when, G when Peter looks at us, he says, we are living stones, this spiritual house, that is getting built around the precious uh, cornerstone of Jesus. He is the cornerstone. Um, but at the same time, uh, and so that, that's the picture, sorry, of the church as the temple of God. Um, not a building then, but the people of God. And then on top of that, uh, we are a, a holy priesthood. And that actually gets back to Exodus uh, chapter, I want to say 18, please forgive me if I'm wrong, but where God says you will be a kingdom of priests. And that is something that God says to the people of Israel just before he gives them the 10 commandments. So I think it's Exodus 18. It might be 19. It might be 17, uh, but it's right in that area. Um, and, and so that's this second portion that's going to be brought out kind of in the verses below. Uh, but before that, they stumble because they disobey the message. They disobey the word. They disobey the gospel. Um, and then he adds, which is what they were destined for. This makes us uncomfortable, right? He's already talked about election once, twice in this letter. But now he's talking about uh, destination, even, uh, or sorry, destiny, even in judgment. But that makes sense, right? Because Psalm 18, 118, Isaiah 8, and Isaiah 26 were not just about um, God's deliverance. They were also about God's judgment, which means that there were people who were destined for judgment. Scary, but unavoidable um, reality. If God's promising that there's going to be a cornerstone and that people are going to reject it, that means there are some people who are destined to reject the cornerstone. And it doesn't mean that they were trying to accept the cornerstone and God stopped them from doing so. They freely chose to reject the cornerstone, but also God knew and planned on them doing so. So this is the mystery of our choice and God's sovereignty. And these concepts are difficult for our brains to exist, uh, have exist simultaneously. And yet it is no trouble for God to fill these truth, his word with these truths. But you are a chosen people. So you are not the ones destined for 
uh, disobedience to the message. We are not the ones destined to stumble. We are the, the opposite. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Let's unpack these briefly. Chosen people is what um, often is Israel is called the chosen people of God in the Old Testament. There are many peoples on the earth. God picks the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, to be his chosen people. And now that is true for anyone who obeys the message, who believes in Jesus, who uh, trusts in the cornerstone. Not only that, we are a royal priesthood. Again, that's going back to Exodus. The concept of a nation of priests has now been fulfilled in Jesus. Um, not only that, but because we've been unified with Christ and because Christ is a great high priest over the household of God and because Jesus is the son of God, he is royal and he is priest. And if we are in him, we too become a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. So we are, we might be, the, the exile might wonder, what nation am I part of? If I'm an exile, where is my home? And now Peter makes it clear. Uh, you're a holy nation. You are God's nation. You are God's special possession. We are his portion, uh, as we'll often see in the Old Testament. That we are God's portion. We are his special possession. And then he gives us an incredible that, um, which denotes purpose. Why has God done this? Why has God chosen, made us a priest, a holy nation, and a special possession? What is the purpose of all of this? And the answer is here, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And so if we're wondering what is our purpose in life, this is the answer, that we may declare. There's no debate, it's a declaration. Declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are saved for worship, brothers and sisters, which means we will always be unsatisfied unless we are living in the way that God has designed us to be. And it turns out that as we give worship to the Lord with our entire lives, we are most satisfied with our existence because we're doing what we're made to do. Once you were not a people, but now, you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now, whoops, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And these last two lines, they come from the book of Hosea. You see, all of these passages up here are very much passages for Jews. And we might wonder, where is Gentile inclusion? This is how last piece is identity. And uh, we might be wondering, where do the Gentiles, where do we get pulled in? And the answer comes from the book of Hosea, where there's an incredible story of God telling his people, you are no longer my people, but redeeming them and saying, now those who were not a people are the people of God. And that book, Hosea, basically uh, foreshadows um, not only the restoration of Israel, but also Gentile inclusion into the people of God. So it's not enough. It's definitely not enough to just call yourself an exile. And it's not enough to call yourself a stranger. To just do this apart from knowing where your home is, is an empty thing. But these verses, verse 9, tell us who we are. They tell us where our home is. They tell us to whom we belong. They tell us why we exist. And when we can live in that new identity, then the exile and the stranger is more of a byproduct of our true identity, of our true home. And that's the way we want to live. We don't want this to be our primary identity. We want it to be a byproduct of our primary identity, that we see ourselves as belonging to the people of God first and foremost.